Greetings folks and welcome to the Electromaker Show. This week we have various projects including a Raspberry Pi Zero inside a game controller, a quadrupedal robot that will be launching soon on Crowd Supply, and of course the Mystery Box competition and much more. So let's get going. First up this week we have a brachiograph using a Raspberry Pi and some hobby servos. Now this thing is kind of amazing because as you can see it's using very basic supplies. There's a lollipop stick and a peg and a pen and three servos. And these are the cheap hobby servos you get in every single Raspberry Pi or Arduino starter kit. Um, now, as you can see, if I replay the video, the image that it comes up with isn't necessarily perfect, although of course I don't really know what the source image was meant to be here. Maybe it was meant to be some kind of leaning Eiffel Tower. But the thing here that is amazing is that these are hobby servos. They're not accurate at all. Um, and this to get this working using such simple tools is a fantastic project. And not only is it a fantastic project, but it has been very, very well documented. So um, this is the actual page for it and showing off uh, a drawing of Ornette Coleman, um, which is, uh, all things considered, very, very accurate, probably more accurate than the Eiffel Tower picture. I don't know if it's because this is a later iteration or because it's using a pencil, I don't know. Um, it does get extra points for using Ornette Coleman. Uh, while I was at college, I studied or Ornette Coleman. I did a music degree and yeah, I, I love Ornette Coleman. So this project has already got like five different ticks from me for that alone. But my personal preferences aside, the thing I love about this is that it's a very thorough walkthrough of how you can do this yourself and the bill of materials couldn't be more simple. Two sticks, a pen or a pencil, a clothes peg, three servo motors, a Raspberry Pi and some glue. A total cost of 14 euros. As you can see, there are various stages to this documentation, including a very thorough getting started guide, which teaches you how to build the plotter um, with various uh, steps and uh, all the little things that they learned while they were doing it. And uh, as you can see, this is very kind of basic baseline way of doing things. You're sticking servo arms to pieces of wood, but it's been approached in such a thorough way that anyone could follow this. Um, and yeah, as well as that, there's a how-to guide as to how to use the Raspberry Pi Zero with the plotter, although of course you could use a, any other Raspberry Pi. Um, and then how to use the library to vectorize bitmap images, which means that any image that you have, you could draw using this brachiograph. It's a thoroughly complete project using very simple tools and exactly the kind of thing that I love. So um, I found this originally on Reddit, as you can see on the Raspberry Pi subreddit, and um, all of these pages that I've just been showing you are the first comment on this Reddit post. So I will just link the Reddit post in the description of the video, um, and then you can go through and have a look at it yourself. But yeah, this is a wonderful project. I am gonna have a go at this myself when I find the time. Um, if you do too, please do let me know. Um, I'd be really interested to see your results. Up next, a Raspberry Pi retro gaming console with a bit of a difference. So retro gaming on the Raspberry Pi using these generic USB SNES controllers is nothing new, but putting the Raspberry Pi inside the SNES controller isn't something that I have seen before. So as you can see, this is the circuit board from the controller, and uh, this here is an HDMI uh, adapter from small to big that fits into the Raspberry Pi Zero just here. And what it means is that you have a retro gaming uh, console that is handheld, but it isn't a handheld retro gaming console because you plug it into you see what I'm getting at here. It's really cool, it's a really nice idea. And again, this project fits under the category, why didn't I think of that? There's been this controller hanging in the background for the entirety of the time that this show has been running. And I have a spare Raspberry Pi Zero that I haven't had anything to do with, really. I love the Raspberry Pi Zero, but I'm definitely guilty of being someone that's never really used it to its full potential. Um, because why would I ever need something so small? Almost everything that I make, if it needs a full operating system rather than just a microcontroller, I'd use a Raspberry Pi. I very rarely need the space. But this, as you can see, fits absolutely perfectly. And as this is shown, it's not particularly difficult to do either. So uh, yeah, this is something that um, I would really, really love to find the time to do. Um, and if I do, I will maybe make a little tutorial about it. Uh, maybe I'll cover it briefly on the show. Um, again, the internet is an amazing place to get these ideas that you wish you'd had yourself. Um, I'll link this in the description. There is no how-to as far as I know, um, but it isn't necessarily too difficult to work out what's going on here. There are a number of buttons on the controller, there are a number of inputs on the Pi Zero, and the rest is all RetroPi. So yeah, this is a very cool project. Now, I've seen various projects which use computer vision to balance objects or bounce objects on a glass plate. But this one is very well documented and is very robust, made of aluminium that the maker CNC'd in their own house. 
Uh, I'm going to play a bit of the video, but I'm going to have to put the sound on because this is one of the most satisfying sounds in the world. Now, as you can probably see in the top right corner of this video, is all the, the different ways that the camera can detect the ball. And uh, uh, yes, the sound of ping pong balls bouncing with servos is music to me. Uh, I, I have a very strange taste in music. Um, but not only, again, is this a project where uh, it's very cool and you can see what is happening here. There's, you know, uh, four motors that are controlling the uh, uh, aluminium arms, which are holding the piece of acrylic in place to bounce the ball. But this is, again, a project which has a very thorough write-up. So alongside the video that we just watched, it goes through all the components needed to create one of these yourself. Although it isn't as simple of a build process because all of the pieces of aluminium were cut by the maker in their own home using a small CNC. But yes, it uses a Teen C4 microcontroller along with uh, stepper motors and of course stepper motor drivers, um, a camera that I don't recognize, the C3 Cam CU135. I would argue that this is probably a generic and you could use any Raspberry Pi camera. I don't think it has to be particularly high focus because the image of the ball is only going to be a much lower resolution image than whatever the camera can put out because you need lower resolution in order to process where it is quickly. And it goes on to say you need a Windows computer with OpenCV on it, although of course you could use any operating system if you're willing to go into the code and change it to work. And all of the parts to find in this Fusion 360 project, which is of course all of the parts you need in order to build it. The article goes on to ask why use 18C 4.0, and the answer is it has a very, very fast clock. Um, but alongside using a microcontroller with a very fast clock, and of course there's a lot of uh, justification as to why they're going to use that, there is also a desktop application built using Unity 3D. And as I've mentioned many times in the past on the show, Unity was really my entry into coding and into physical computing, despite the fact that everything you make in Unity isn't physical. It sort of got me thinking about how code can interact with how things move and how things work. And it was a small step then to start using Arduinos. And in fact, I started using Arduino with Unity. That was the sort of joining path for me. I, I uh, get, would attach uh, an Arduino to Unity and use physical uh, inputs on the Arduino to move things within the Unity game engine. So this is right up my street. And as I mentioned, um, the, all the parts were made using a small CNC machine. Um, and this is, this is quite nice, actually, um, because the CNC machine had to move consistently for weeks in order to make all of these parts. Um, they made a little box in order to silence it as well as possible. Um, and yeah, that's, uh, that's pretty much a must because the sound of milling aluminium is not particularly pleasant. Now, I will, of course, include a link to the Octo Bouncer blog post in the description of this video. Um, and there's a lot of diving you can do from here. There are two further blog posts from way back, um, which follow this project from the very start. This thing has been going for about five years, um, and uh, there's been multiple iterations over time. And, of course, there is a GitHub with all of the code you will need for Unity and for the microcontroller and for Autodesk if you would like to build one yourself. Um, I will leave a link to the original blog post in the description of this video. So in last week's show, I featured a project which uses the M5 stack ESP32 camera, and we also took a look at the new ESP32 module they have with a little screen and various I.O. And lo and behold, this week there was a project using the M5 stack keyboard. The M5 stack keyboard is a very cool little device. I've never, I, I had no idea it existed actually. Um, but from what I gather, it's an 80 mega chip that is uh, uh, taking care of all of the button inputs, and it's going straight into an ESP32 equipped screen from Adafruit. Uh, now, this is touted as an OS-less, as in no operating system pocket computer, and the uh, comment section is full of arguments as to whether that is true or not. Is MicroPython an operating system? I don't particularly care. This is a very cool little machine, and as someone who is a writer who is also always looking for the most bare-bones writing machine that I can have, uh, because distractions are real, this is a very cool little idea. Now, of course, I don't think I could ever really type using one of those M5 stack little uh, keyboard things that are in the video here. But nevertheless, uh, yeah, this is something pretty cool. And by the way, just in case you're interested, um, the M5 stack keyboard is called the Card KB. And uh, yeah, it is an 80 mega chip that is running it. And they are $5.95, currently out of stock, unfortunately, at the minute. Um, but uh, if you are interested, you can always keep an eye on that and see when it comes back in. And of course, other stockists might have it. 
And the screen which has an ESP32 built into it is the Adafruit Pi Portal Titano. Now I am very aware I just said Adafruit and then Adafruit. I haven't quite settled on a pronunciation quite yet. We have featured the Mystic Chicken on this show before and the videos that the Mystic Chicken makes are fantastic. They are full of humour, they are shot very well and the projects are always very fun and cool. And this is no exception. This is a QR code controlled Malteser dispenser. Now what does that mean exactly? Well, I mean, it dispenses Maltesers when you scan a QR code. I mean, it couldn't be simpler. It's, it's, it's a QR code that dispenses Maltesers. It, uh, the, Q, the, the clue was in the title, I guess. But yes, as I said previously, uh, the Mystic Chicken makes fantastic videos. They are fast paced, they are funny, they are informative, and there is a chicken. So uh, yeah, what more could anyone want? Multiple chickens. It is once again time to dig into our mystery box. So, uh, you probably know the score by now. This is a mystery box. Um, I keep the top covered because I'm trying to keep it a little bit of a mystery for myself as well. So far, we've given away development boards and various different sensors, including this cool little Bluetooth thing that we gave away a few weeks ago. Um, and some of the kits we've given away are actually pretty chunky. Turns out that one of the uh, kits that we had is worth about $500 or so. Anyway, um, this could be the first week that something comes out that is absolutely useless, so let's see what we find. Alrighty then, that's a plastic box. We don't think we've had a plastic box before. This is, what is this? An Intel RealSense 3D camera. Oh, cool. Okay, so I'm guessing this is somewhat a bit like the Kinect or something in that it is a 3D camera that can plot. I have no idea. Let me look this up quite quickly. Yes, as I thought, this is a 3D depth sensing camera. Um, this works with your computer. It also works with tablets. And this is the development kit. Um, there's a lot of examples of this being used online. If you just search for a RealSense 3D camera on YouTube, you'll find a lot of people have used it in projects already. And this one is going out to one of our watchers. So uh, we have the prize. Now we just need the prize winner. And this week's winner is Richard Perrett. Congratulations, we'll be in touch with you as to how we can get this thing sent out to you. There'll be another mystery box competition next week and every week until we run out of mystery box. But for now, let's get on with the show. And now Momonga, which is a four-legged 3D printed robot which is about to be launched on Crowd Supply. And I don't know what your definition of cute is, but these ones certainly fit mine. Um, you can see them all moving in sync here and uh, dancing around and uh, there's something about the chunkiness of them that really really appeals to me um, and because they are 3D printed of course presumably the idea would be that you could get the full kits and you could build them yourself or you can print them yourself. Uh, now as I say this is not quite uh, ready to launch yet, it will be, uh, although it will be open sourced which makes me think that of course every uh, aspect of it will be available to people if they want to build it themselves. Now a lot of detail has gone into how these things are made. You can see the leg mechanism here uh, in action um, and a, uh, a breakdown of how each leg works along with the tiny little motors that are being used. 3D printed, kind of chunky, kind of cute robots that work with the Arduino IDE sounds lovely and uh, when this project does launch I will of course come back to it on the show and let you know. Up next, Precursor, which is a secure open hardware smartphone based on the RISC-V system on chip. Now I know this isn't directly the usual fodder for this show, but it is something so cool that I kind of wanted to cover it, because it does actually cover a few of the bases we've talked about in the past. And the main reason behind it is that this is using an FPGA uh, system on chip, so this, you can develop this any way you want. It can be completely customised and the idea has been designed to be completely secure. You can basically make it as secure as you want it to be. Um, now, there are a variety of different kind of open source smartphones out there, some of which work with uh, varying degrees of success. Um, I'm quite uh, fond of the Pine phone, although it's not quite there for me yet. Uh, like I've said before, I'm very tempted when it comes to buying a new smartphone to dive into that. Um, but by the same token, it has to pretty much replace the smartphone that I already have. And as to whether any of them do or precursor would, for that matter, is something that I am not sure of yet. But as far as projects go, if you are interested in uh, open hardware, if you're interested in secure communication, this looks like a very, very compelling idea. So as you can see here, they're really pushing the idea of this being completely transparent and open. Um, I, I'll just read it. Every bit of precursor is inspectable and hackable. That includes the main board, daughter cards and case, the system on chip implementation, the EC implementation, the MVP, firmware and the work in progress operating system. 
So the system on chip is a Xilinx XC7S50 and it has 16 megabytes of external SRAM, 128 megabytes of flash along with a bunch of other things. I won't bore you by reading all of them out here. Um, but if you are someone who is interested in security, especially embedded security, this is a very compelling project. Um, now, as you can see, this is the pre-launch page. It hasn't launched yet. There is no uh, real indication as to price. Um, and of course, to get anything that isn't a standard smartphone these days, you have to really want to uh, be outside of the regular smartphone ecosystem. And I understand that. And I also understand this isn't the usual stuff we cover on the show, but it was a little too cool to pass by. Um, so there'll be a link to this one in the description. I'd be super interested to hear what any of you think about this as a project um, because yeah there's no shortage of different kinds of smartphones out there this one to me is the most open and interesting one for developers I have seen yet um, and we will definitely be coming back to this one in the future up next an update from platform IO platform IO version 2.0 for VS code is out and if you're not aware, uh, Platform IO is a, a, an extension for VS Code, which allows you to program Arduinos and various other microcontrollers while getting all of the benefits that you get from VS Code, including a, a debugger and a, a code completion and a bunch of nice stuff that you don't get with the Arduino IDE. So on top of everything that Platform IO already did, there is a new Task Explorer. And as well as the Task Explorer, you can switch between um, environments, which is kind of great because beforehand, um, you would always have to go into the platformio.ini file and make changes there. Um, and uh, that wasn't ideal. Now, I will admit it's not something that I run up against too often because usually I work on one project at a time anyway. And uh, since making the switch over to platform.io, um, I treated it a little bit more like I would any other coding project and just make uh, single places and single development environments for each project. But if you're working on multiple different projects with multiple different types of build, then yeah, this is gonna be huge. So the example that they give here um, kind of highlights why this is so useful um, because you can straight from the menu in Visual Studio Code choose what environment you are building for. So yeah, as I said before, if you're working with multiple different boards on different projects, this is gonna be quite a time saver. Platform IO also has a new installer, which I'm actually running as we speak um, because I uh, didn't have Platform IO on my main computer for quite some time. I've been using my laptop for everything that involves moving around um, and I only just reinstalled everything on the big computer um, because yeah, uh, nuking the big computer every now and again is good because it gets slow. So if you already have Platform IO installed, you can just head to its page on the extensions menu and update it. Or if, like me, you didn't have it installed at the time, you can install it from here. And uh, yeah, the new installer is pretty quick. Um, I was actually installing it while I was talking to you about the uh, website side of it. And now it's asking me to restart VS Code, which I will as soon as I finish filming. If you've never used Platform IO, I suggest taking a quick look at it. Um, even if you've been using the Arduino IDE exclusively for a long time, or you have your own development setup, um, I was pleasantly surprised with how well it actually all fits together with VS Code. Um, you don't really have to jump through many hoops. They've made it very, very easy. Um, and if I had to make the choice of one between using the Arduino IDE, which is of course very simple and something that I'm used to having used it for years, and VS Code with Platform IO, I might lean towards Platform IO these days. It's really, really come on since its first release. Um, and yeah, um, platformio.org is where you can get it. Although, of course, as I said, you can also get it from the extensions menu of Visual Studio Code. And finally this week, something I spotted on the Arduino Project subreddit. This is a simulator for addressable LEDs. So be those the Adafruit NeoPixels, Adafruit NeoPixels, or the WS2812B, WS2811, doesn't really matter. Uh, five volt addressable LED strips, they all have more or less the same functionality when used with an Arduino. Problem is, by the time you've got the Arduino out and the LED strip out, especially if you're a little shorter on time, like parents or whatever, um, you don't really have much time to actually fiddle around working out how to make cool patterns using them. And that is where this comes in. Um, rather than waffle on anymore, I'm just gonna start it so you can see. So as you can see, it's wiping through with red and it's gonna wipe through with green. And if you look at the code down here on the left, it's saying to color wipe with red, color wipe with green, color it with blue, do theater chases with white, blue, and red colors, and then rainbow cycles. It's all here in the code and it is all happening over here on the right side. 
Now, whether you're using the uh, Adafruit or Adafruit NeoPixel library or you're using Fast LED, all of this will be somewhat familiar. Um, you can make your own functions and then you can call them from loop to do various things. And once you've got everything set up, then yeah, it's fine. Uh, you can fiddle with them to your heart's content, but it's not necessarily easy unless you've got a dedicated spot to leave an Arduino and an LED strip set up to do this kind of debugging. To be able to get a bunch of it out of the way using a simulation is kind of huge, and I kind of feel like anyone who is wanting to set up addressable LEDs as part of their smart home solution, or just for fun, will have a lot of use out of something like this. So um, there's various examples listed here in the Reddit post, and uh, the maker is also uh, present in the comments answering questions about it. So um, I will just link the actual Reddit thread in the description of the video, and you can look through all of these yourself. But I thought it was definitely something worth mentioning, because if you are someone who works with LED strips, this is going to be a massive time saver. That is our show for this week. Thank you so much for tuning in. There's an Electromaker show every week. If you are enjoying the show, please like and subscribe to the channel. Maybe share it with a friend. And of course, every comment on the video enters you to the Mystery Box competition for next week's show. But for now, I hope you have a fantastic week. Stay safe, stay creative, and I'll see you then.